and my name is Carla Bowman from the Euclid Public Library, and I want to welcome everyone to this evening's program. This is a joint program between the East Cleveland Public Library and the Euclid Public Library, and this is the uh, last in a series of three programs where we have been discussing the book Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans, and the Making of the Modern World, 1471 to the Second World War. And we are um, very excited to welcome the author of the book with us tonight. Um, the author will speak about his book, and then we'll have time to ask questions, answer questions at the end. If you think of a question as we're going through, please just throw it in the chat, and we'll go through those again at the end of the program. Uh, we do have 10 signed copies of the book, Born in Blackness, as giveaways, so we will pull names of the winners and contact the winners in the next few days to stop by the library to pick up their copy of the book. So now I would like to introduce our speaker, Howard W. French, is a career foreign correspondent and global affairs writer and the author of five books, including four works of nonfiction and a work of documentary photography. Howard French worked as a French English translator in, I know I'm gonna get this wrong, Abidjan, Ivory Coast in the early 1980s and taught English literature for several years at the University of Abidjan. His career in journalism began as a freelance reporter for the Washington Post and other publications in West Africa. He joined the New York Times in 1986 and worked as a metropolitan reporter with the newspaper for three years. And then from 1990 to 2008, reported overseas for the Times as bureau chief for Central America and the Caribbean, West and Central Africa, Japan and the Koreas, and China. Dr. French is the president of the board of directors of the IRIN News Agency. He was a 2011-2012 fellow of the Open Society Foundations. Other awards include an honorary doctorate from the University of Maryland. The book that we're discussing this evening, Born in Blackness, won the Museum of African American History Stone Book Award for 2022. This is an award that recognizes the most exemplary contemporary scholarship and writing within the field of African American history and culture. So thank you very much audience for joining us and thank you Dr. French for um, coming here to talk to us about your book this evening. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Clara. Yeah, is there anything that I left out of your bio that you'd like to add? No, I don't think so. I hear it so often that it sort of makes me cringe a little bit, but you got everything okay. right. Thank you. Okay, all right, well, very good. So um, I think we'll just go ahead and get jump into our questions. Um, so the first thing we'd, we'd like to ask you to, to talk about is what was Africa's role in the books, um, as, as you mentioned in the book's title, in making the making of the modern world? Uh, thank you. So the normal, the, one of the principal reasons I took on this project and wrote this book is because of a kind of um, if, uh, gradual response in adulthood to things that I had in, uh, learned in childhood and in school. And I think these are things that we all, or most of us at least, learn in school. And that is that the thing called the modern age um, uh, begins with a quest by people in a Southern Europe, in specific in Portugal and to a lesser extent in Spain, to figure out a route to the Far East. Uh, and this is the story that usually we all receive to explain how the modern age kicks off and how the world comes to be connected uh, entirely together, each continent in a permanent way. Um, and uh, as a, partly as a result of a research I did on my last book about uh, a previous immediate prior book about Ch Chinese history, uh, in which I read a lot about the 15th century and the accounts of Portuguese navigators in the 15th century, and partly because of my experience as a, as a journalist for the New York Times and, and elsewhere, working in the Atlantic Basin, I came to understand that actually this interconnection of the world that we um, uh, describe as being essential to the, to, to the birth of the modern age begins well before the Iberian voyages of discovery that we learn about. So, and it begins with voyages of discovery that are not concerned with Asia at all, in fact, but are preoccupied with connecting, finding ways for Europeans to connect to um, uh, advanced civilizations 
and rich civilizations in sub-Saharan Africa. So these are things we don't usually hear at all about, at all about. We don't ever hear, in fact, let me just back up to say the age of exploration, which is the the, the tale of how the Iberians and, and most principally the Portuguese were set out in a sort of obsessive way to discover the Far East by sea, right? Um, we If we hear about Africa at all, in the description of the opening of that age in the 15th century, Africa is described as an obstacle. The, the, the Portuguese are trying desperately to figure out a way to get around Africa. Africa is presented to us as uh, a geographic zone of no interest, only of danger, that it's tropical and therefore uh, mysterious and deadly, and that, um, uh, but that there's no civilizations there and no sources of wealth there. And the story, in fact, begins, as I said, a century prior to this, in the early 14th century, when an empire called Mali in the western bulge of West Africa um, begins undertaking a series of grand expeditions, hoping uh, from its perspective, to connect with the rest of the world. The first of these expeditions, or the first two of these expeditions, were undertaken by a Malian empire who is little known, but whose life and work I describe in my book, called Abu Bakr II. And Abu Bakr II wants, uh, mounts two bids uh, more than a century before Columbus to try to cross the Atlantic. In the second of these expeditions, he disappears at sea. The, the emperor himself disappears at sea and is never heard from again. But the reason for these voyages is that Mali in the 14th century and prior to that even, was the most important source of gold in, in, uh, into Europe. The Europeans didn't know about Mali. They didn't know where the gold was coming from. They knew gold came from Africa, but it was arriving in Europe via Berber tribes and kingdoms that lived in the very north of Africa in places like present-day Morocco. Um, and so um, uh, Abu Bakr II, as a ruler of Mali, was looking for ways to uh, trade gold uh, so that it didn't have to pass through the hands of middlemen in North Africa. And he mounts these two expeditions, the second of which fails, he disappears at sea. And then his successor, a man who is somewhat better known, uh, especially in, in popular culture, uh, sometimes he's called the richest person in the history of the world, is a man named Mansa Musa. And Mansa Musa, after the death of Abu Bakr II, crosses the Sahara Desert and goes on pilgrimage to Mecca. And along the way, he stops in Cairo. And Mansa Musa is traveling with an extraordinary um, a cortege of uh, traders and servants and court people. Uh, and he's carrying 18 tons of gold. And the 18 tons of gold, Mansa Musa distributes. This is more gold than has ever been in the control of a single individual ever before or since in history. And he gives it all away in his pilgrimage uh, uh, before reaching Mecca, but in his pilgrimage in the stop in Cairo uh, along the way. And he does this, I explain, because he is seeking rep recognition for Mali as a major player in the Islamic world, and he's looking for alternative trade routes that he can use to do commerce in his gold. He's advertising his gold wealth, and he wants to establish trade routes that get around the middlemen that I described of North Africa. So this is, as I describe it in my book, really the spark that births the modern age. And it does so because the price of gold collapses on world markets. Nobody has ever seen so much gold distributed in such a short period of time. Uh, in, in one region, and the region here is the Eastern Mediterranean, but the price of gold collapses all the way into Europe for, for as long as a decade. And this sets a fire, the imagination of the Europeans who are now, who become determined to figure out where is this place called Mali and what, what is the source of their gold and how can we establish trade, not with some empty spot on the map of an Africa without civilization or culture, but with what becomes a, a fabled kingdom of incredible achievement and enormous wealth. And so um, this is a slightly long answer, I recognize, but in the beginnings of the 15th century, the Portuguese then take the lead uh, in setting out by sea and trying to discover how to connect with Mali. And it takes them the better part of the 15th century, meaning the 1400s, from the 1430s all the way to 1470s, 
They are trying bit by bit to make their way down the coast of West Africa, looking for the source of this gold from Mali. They actually never, the Portuguese never actually find a route to Mali because Mali is not on the sea, but they arrive in 1471, a, num a date that exists in the title of my book, in present day Ghana. And in present day Ghana, they discover another fabulously rich source of gold in Africa, and they establish a trade in gold with the local population there that makes the Portuguese kingdom, Portugal was perhaps the, the, the weakest and the poorest nation in Western Europe at the time, and suddenly by virtue of trade with Ghana in this place called Elmina, the Portuguese become wealthy. And this is what funds all of the great and much more famous Portuguese exploration that we have all learned about in school, such as Bartolomeu Diaz discovering a route into the um, Indian Ocean and Vasco da Gama if finally finding a way to the east that we all learned about, right? But this was all based on a breakthrough to West Africa and uh, uh, obtaining wealth via trade with West Africa such that Portugal could finally get onto its feet as a prosperous kingdom in Europe and build a fleet of exploration. Tremendously important historical development. This is what connects all of the continents eventually and therefore gives birth to the modern era and by the way, just to finish up, this is also what gives birth to or, or lends life to uh, uh, the ambitions of Christopher Columbus, who has, as we all know, had this dream to sail west across the Atlantic in a bid to prove that the earth was round and that you could reach, reach Asia by traveling west from Europe, right? Uh, Columbus had worked in the trade of gold for the Portuguese back and forth to Elmina in Ghana. He had, he had worked as a ship's captain for the Portuguese, ferrying supplies to Elmina and ferrying gold back to Portugal. And in doing so, he begins to learn the currents of the sea that allowed him much later to cross the Atlantic and make his way back home to Europe. But something else really important happens here, and that is the Spanish discover, the Spanish and the Portuguese were rivals in this period. And when the Spanish discovered how much money the Portuguese were earning from uh, the trade in gold with West Africa, the Spanish decided that they had to also get into the game, so to speak, game, quote unquote, of exploration and fund fleets of discovery of their own. And this is the reason why the Spanish then finance Columbus's voyages and Columbus gets three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria across the Atlantic. He gets this backing by the Spanish. The Spanish had previously refused him. He gets this backing from the Spanish because the Portuguese had established such a profitable bridgehead in trade with Africa. All of that is cut out of the conventional ways that we learn of the history of this age. And it's not far from there that we then move into chattel slavery and the plantation agriculture. Correct. So can you tell us how that begins? Sure. Uh, so um, this um, picks up very nicely from, from where I left off. The Portuguese and the Spanish, you know, geology, all of the sciences were weakly developed in this uh, early uh, period of the modern age. And so that means geology, geography, uh, navigation, uh, nautical science, um, everything, right? And so the, the Portuguese and the Spanish um, developed this theory that if there's so much gold in tropical Africa, then gold must be distributed, they thought, according to the latitudes <laughs> of the earth, and that gold would therefore lo logically be abundant in tropical latitudes everywhere. And so the, we learn that the Portuguese were hell-bent on reaching Asia the Portuguese did not rush on to Asia after discovering gold in Elmina. They continued for three more decades to try to discover more gold in Africa on the theory that gold was distributed in the way that I just described at tropical latitudes. Um, and um, so while they're making this uh, sort of uh, these explorations, they discovered an island off the coast of Central Africa called Sao Tome. They gave it the name Sao Tome. Sao Tome was uninhabited. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. It's located almost exactly on the equator. It's mountainous. It's volcanic. Uh, it has extraordinarily rich soil because it's volcanic. And it has uh, seasonal rains, abundant seasonal rains. 
Well, the Portuguese quickly discover that this is the ideal sort of ecosystem and environment in which to grow sugar. Sugar, meaning sugar from sugarcane, was an extraordinarily rare and expensive luxury in Europe up until this point in history. The Portuguese had begun to produce sugar on a, on a small scale far to the north in the Atlantic in places like Madeira and the Canary Islands. But some Portuguese sailor in this bid to discover gold had brought cuttings of sugar cane along on board of his ship ah. and planted them in Sao Tome and discovers that sugar grows in an explosive way in Sao Tome. Um, sugar grows in an explosive way in Sao Tome. I'm still getting quite an echo. Sorry. Uh, the, the explosive uh, uh, growth is due to the environmental nature and uh, that I've described. The problem is there's no labor. And the Portuguese knew, as everyone who has ever grown sugar has known in history, that sugar, that cultivating sugar is an extremely brutal process, that nobody wants to, will not wants to, nobody will voluntarily work in sugar cultivation. And that is because sugar has to be grown in densely planted fields, in muddy soils that are very fertile uh, and, and rich and heavily irrigated. Um, and sugar, moreover, uh, has um, sugarcane has long leaves that have serrated edges to them, which are extremely sharp and which which will lacerate the skin. And so, everywhere sugar had ever been grown in 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 history prior to this, sugar be, sugar originates in the east, in New Guinea and Indonesia, places like that, and spends a thousand years prior to the story we're telling very slowly transiting through the Middle East and then finally into the Western Mediterranean. In all of these places, cult sugar cultivation has been associated with forced labor or with enslavement. And so the Portuguese begin to plant sugar in Sao Tome, but they, 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 nobody wants to do the work, even though the profit is, uh, the prospect of great profits is very high. And so the Portuguese begin to, uh, uh, trade in human beings uh, on the nearby coast of Central Africa, uh, who are then uh, enslaved for the purpose of growing sugar. These two things, these twin things, are the, are the, are the proximate engines of, the, of this thing, the modern age that I've described for you. So, so the discovery of gold is what kicks off all of the exploration, and gold is an inherently profitable thing the Portuguese had made so much money from gold in the first few years of trade with Elmina that they actually named the royal treasury for Africa. They called it the House of Guinea. The royal treasury of the entire kingdom of Portugal was called the House of Guinea. Guinea was shorthand for, for Black Africa, right? Uh, but sugar um, uh, goes very quickly on to replace even gold as a source of profit. Sugar is almost like a recipe if you can find the labor Sugar is almost a recipe for printing money. And so the Portuguese begin to contract with kingdoms in Central Africa and in West Africa for human beings whom they enslave, and they perfect this recipe. I'm sorry to keep repeating recipe. Design is perhaps a better word. They begin to perfect the design uh, of industrial systems for the growth and production of sugar. And these systems are what we call I think in a somewhat euphemistic way, the plantation. The modern plantation is born right there in Sao Tome uh, for the production of sugar. Uh, it is a very intricate and sophisticated thing. The production of sugar requires lots of specialized tasks. It requires very um, intricate synchronization of different processes, the cutting, the planting, the drying, the boiling, um, uh, the, and the harvesting, all of these things have to be done under a very rigorous calendar. Any one step out of order or mistimed can ruin the entire process. Um, and so, so, so along with this birth of this industrial thing that we call the plantation, you see the birth of this institution called chattel slavery, which is what really kicks off the development of Europe, the settling, quote unquote, of the Western Hemisphere, meaning the Americas, uh, very soon, which I'm going to come to. Uh, this all happens in Sao Tome. And these two institutions of the plantation and of chattel slavery are conjoined. They are born in a twinned sort of way at the very same time. 
it's important to understand what makes chattel slavery different from other kinds of slavery. Human beings have been enslaving other human beings in every part of the world throughout human history. This is not the monopoly of any one race or of any one culture or of any one region or even of any one time, right? What is different about chattel slavery is, uh, well, there are two things that are most important to emphasize here. One of them is that the chattel slavery that is born as an institution at this time in Sao Tome is entirely racially based. Uh, the Portuguese develop religious justifications, economic justifications, and, a, and sort of an ideology around the idea that Black people from sub-Saharan Africa are the legitimate subjects of enslavement. The, the, na the, the fact of the color of their skin is a license, according to this ideology, mm -hmm. for their enslavement. And this is this forms the basis of what you, we might call enchattelment. What does enchattelment mean? You hear the same word chattel in enchattelment. Enchattelment means turning human beings into cattle. Uh, chattel and capital, meaning money, have the same root in Latin. And so what it means is the um, um, dehumanizing people and turning them into instruments of capital. They're simply um, uh, units of production for, for the purpose of, uh, of, of, uh, of, out, of generating output in these industrial um, um, organizations that we've called plantations. The other feature of it is, so we have the racial feature um, and, the, and the dehumanization. The other feature, and this is worth emphasizing because it is so utterly unique from uh, almost every other version of slavery we have seen in history. Um, Africans, as they were enslaved first by the Portuguese and then subs subsequently by many other kinds of Europeans through enchattelment for work in plantations, were not only made slaves in the instance of a, sing of a particular individual, if he or she was bought and sold, but um, their, their, their issue and their increase, this is the language of the slave owner. Issue means uh, they're, um, they're the product of a couple. If, if the slaves don't die before uh, a male and a female can produce a child, um, they have what's called issue and increase. That means they're producing capital. That's more capital, also more cattle, so to speak, for the profit of the slave owner. And this is not just the a phenomenon that lasts one generation. So the slave, he or she, the person who's enslaved, taken away, sold into slavery is property. Her or his issue is property. And their increase, meaning further generations down the road, are all taken automatically as property. It becomes, according to this ideology, the natural destiny of all such people to remain slaves at, down through the generations and un, in the ownership or under the control of owners, right? That is chattel slavery. So these two things are born in Sao Tome. And by an accident of navigation, as you heard from me, uh, the Portuguese are still trying in the 1470s, 80s to discover and 90s to keep discovering gold. They're really very active. They're not rushing on to Asia. They're very actively looking for gold in tropical latitudes of Africa. And as they navigate down the coast of Africa, they copy a technique, a sailing technique that they learned from Arabs, which we call tacking. That means cutting backwards and forwards in ever larger triangles out west to sea and then back east toward the continent in order to make their way down the coast, coast of this enormous continent of Africa in a more rapid way, right? And as they are cutting these triangles, west to east, west then east, west then east, they bump into Brazil by accident. The Portuguese, oh. uh, Columbus was actually looking for uh, Asia, right? He thought he had found Japan and China. He have, was of course in Bahamas and various other places like that, right? The Portuguese were not looking for, to prove that the earth was round. They were not looking for other continents. They were looking for a way down the coast of Africa more quickly. And by doing this tacking at the turn of the 16th century, they, by accident, they bump into Brazil. And the Portuguese take over Brazil very quickly. Uh, initially, they so the Portuguese have built the beginnings of um, a, a new economy based on chattel slavery and on, on um, 
plantation agriculture for the production of sugar. Uh, and they trans quickly when they discover Brazil has a very similar environment to Central Africa in terms of climate, et cetera. They very quickly try to begin growing and producing sugar in Brazil. At first, they do this with, uh, 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 attempt to do this using uh, um, indigenous labor from, from that part of the Americas. The Portuguese are carrying diseases with them that the uh, native population has never encountered before, therefore doesn't have any immunity to. Uh, this produces an enormous, enormous death toll among the native populations of what we now call Brazil. And by the middle of the 16th century, meaning the 1550s, the 1560s, the Portuguese begin to get the idea that they should simply bring Africans across the Atlantic into the New World in ever larger numbers. The, the, the scheme to use native labor in the Americas isn't working. And so they get the idea to, to replace them with Africans. And this is the, really the birth of the mass uh, transatlantic slave trade. I want to uh, give you a, an idea of how quickly uh, this begins to pay off for the Port Portuguese and to help you imagine the scale of the tragedy that was involved for Africans. Um, the Portuguese, by 1570, the Portuguese are almost entirely using African labor to grow sugar in Brazil. They're growing sugar in two huge regions of Brazil, Bahia and Pernambuco, both of them mostly sort of northern in, uh, areas of Brazil. Between 1570, when, they, when Africans African labor fully takes over, and 1630, Brazil, I'm sorry, Portugal earns more money from the production of sugar through chattel slavery and plantation agriculture than Spain made in the same period raiding and sacking great uh, indigenous empires in the Americas, things that you've all heard about. The defeat, the Spanish conquest of the Incas and the Spanish conquest of the Aztecs and things like that. Spain was 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 obtaining so much gold and silver from these military feats in this period that they had to invent an entire new class of ship to carry all of the the the, the metals back across the Atlantic and and later to China where they traded uh, for for uh, silk and and tea and various other things. This class of ship was called the galleon. They had huge fat bellies. And because they were so laden with gold or, or with silver that they, they could only travel very slowly, right? Spectacularly, Portugal in this same period, through the much less dramatic, but in fact, even more tragic process of, of chattel slavery and plantation agriculture is out earning the Spanish in Brazil through the production of sugar. In 1630, we see England uh, gets in on this game, game quote unquote. It sees how England had been a bit player in the contest for intra-European power up until this time in history. England was not a major power in, in Europe, in other words, um, nor was France briefly in this period. France, uh, Spain and Portugal were the big players for the reasons of their two approaches, which I've just, just described. Port Portugal, plantation agriculture, chattel slavery, Spain, conquest, and gold and silver. So England um, uh, captures or seizes control of the island of Barbados in the Eastern Caribbean, which is not far from the coast of South America. And it copies the techniques of the Brazilians, the Portuguese and the Dutch who lived and, and, and exploited Africans in Brazil for the purpose of producing sugar on their own in Barbados. Barbados is one sixth the size of, I'm, I'm a New Yorker, so I'm gonna use a local reference, a reference geographically to, to help you with this, but I'll also use one from another part of the country. Barbados is one sixth the size of Long Island here in New York. It's one third the size of Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles. When I say size, I mean surface area, right? That tiny, sir, in that tiny surface area, the English brought as many slaves as were brought to the United States or to the territories that were eventually, that eventually became the United States. As many human beings from Africa were brought to grow sugar in that tiny surface area, Barbados, as were brought to what would become the United States across the entire history of the United States. And in Barbados, between 1630, when the English first begin to do this, and the end of that century, meaning the end of the 1600s, England had earned as much as 
Portugal had earned in Brazil. In other words, also more than the Spanish had earned in sacking the Aztecs and the Incas. The, the, the English then get on their feet as an imperial power. This begins to uh, help them finance a big fleet. They have a war with Spain, very fa famously. The Spanish Armada attacks England. England is now capable of mounting a great defense and defeats the Spanish Armada. England takes over the island of Jamaica, which is much bigger, geographically speaking, than Barbados. It then installs, so that happens in 1707. England then installs this sugar industry with chattel slavery on a far bigger scale, on a far bigger island in uh, Jamaica. And England is therefore off to the races as an imperial power. British people, I talked to you about how we as Americans tend to learn about the birth of modernity and the age of exploration, things like this. Now I must speak about how British people learn about the birth of their own empire. The conventional story in, in British education has empire beginning in India. So the in, British go east and they take over India and they make an enormous amount of money in India, et cetera, et cetera, through tea and whatnot, trade. Um, that's, that's more than a century after what happens in Barbados. Barbados is the linchpin. It is the foundation stone upon which British empire is built. And Jamaica is the, is the next gigantic building block long before we get to, 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 um, uh, to India. I, I, I don't know um, if uh, you would like me, you'd like to move on to another question. I do want to come back uh, at some point to how France gets in on this game because it has tremendous consequences for American history and for all of our history, in fact. But please come ahead with your next question, Carla. Well, I just want to make a comment. I really found it fascinating in the book to learn about how all of these economies were intertwined. I wasn't really aware of that. So I really appreciate learning about that. I also want to thank you for going through this chronologically. Mm -hmm. I think that is really helpful to see how all the pieces and parts just line up together to make this cohesive story. Thank you. Um, yeah, but I think you've brought us now to um, where we bring Africans to the new world and what this creates um, and what we to what we now refer to as the West. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, it's important to dwell for a second on what we mean by the West, right? It's yeah. a, I'm, a, I'm a journalist by profession and by career history, I teach journalism. I'm also a citizen, I'm a news reader, I'm a, just a human being, right? And it's, it's, um, it's uh, it's long been striking to me how easily we throw around the word West, the West, without really stopping to ponder what we mean by this term. And so I want to offer a functional uh, definition that I have used in the arguments uh, that I make in my book, but I think are worth uh, have a value beyond my arguments and are are worth just worth pausing on for a second together. I define the West as a condominium. That means a, 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 a joint project, uh, an alliance, uh, a, um, a um, uh, what shall I call it? A, um, well, yeah, a, a joint project is, 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 is as good as anything between the Atlantic facing parts of Western Europe and the territories that we have, we once eat, uh, often called the new world. Of course, there were people in the New World long before Europeans came. It wasn't new to them. What was new to them was the arrival of the Europeans, right? And so Europe, New World is a problematic term, and we should, we should be mindful of that. But for convenience sake, let's just call the West the joint development of Western Europe, Atlantic-facing Western Europe, and the New World, how uh, Western Europeans... Um, uh, uh, invested themselves, politically speaking, militarily, economically, et cetera, in um, uh, uh, settling and in enriching themselves through the development of these new territories that they acquired uh, in continental in the Caribbean, in continental North America, and in South America. So that's the West for me. If there were no North America, South America, and the Caribbean, and all you had was Europe, it is hard for me to imagine, and this is very important. I'm not asking everyone to submit to my logic or to agree with me off, off the bat. I have made, a, I think, a quite an extended and detailed argument about this in my book. 
But it's very hard for me to imagine that without the new world, Europe would be uh, the leading civilizational region of the world, that Europe would be the richest part of the world in uh, for the for, for for the you know these most recent centuries. It is hard for me to imagine Europe emerging as a, a, a dominant part of uh, um, human civilization. And the reason for that is because until chattel slavery and until plantation agriculture um, spread in the so-called new world, Europe was not a leader in world civilization, in wealth or in power. For a very long stretch of centuries, in fact, from the beginning of history, other parts of the world were almost always more powerful and more wealthy than Europe. Um, uh, for, most of the time that was, in, that was China, sometimes it was India, at various other times it was Persia, sometimes it was Turkey, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there is no long story of European preeminence in terms of uh, wealth and power in world history until chattel slavery and plantation agriculture. And it is my belief and my argument that these two terrible innovations are what propelled uh, uh, Europe into a position to take over the West, or I'm sorry, to create the West, to take over the New World and to create the West and into a position of preeminence in terms of power and wealth in the world. Um, so, so that's the creation of the West. I wanna leave you with a, a singular sort of data point that I think really, really helps us to understand this. I, I mentioned this in the book, it usually uh, surprises audiences when I, when, I, when I speak to this. Until the year 1820, four times as many Africans were brought across the Atlantic Ocean than Europeans. Let me just repeat that. Until 1820, four times as many people were brought across, brought across by the Europeans, by the way, in slave ships. Four times more people were brought across the Atlantic from Africa than from Europe. That means, that simple figure, I think, helps convey the extent to which the settlement and the economic exploitation the clearing of forests, the digging of ditches and canals, the, the harnessing of the environment, the development of agriculture, the building of road systems, of railway systems, what have you, was dependent in the foundational period of settlement of the so-called New World. How uh, extraordinarily dependent these things were on chattel slavery and on the exploitation of African labor. And so the argument here is that these institutions, the plantation and enchattlement of Africans, were foundational to the creation of the West, and not just to the creation of the West, not that that's a small thing, but to the catapulting of Europe and its descendant civilizations in the so-called New World into positions of preeminent power and wealth in the world. I think you made that argument very well in the book. So thank you. You convinced us. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just want to remind all of the participants if you have any questions for Dr. French, you can put those in the chat. Um, there should be time at the end. You can ask a question if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, but I'll finish up with my final question, which was if you could just touch on the um, role of the, ha the Haitian Revolution in the history of the United States. Wonderful. So that was where I said I would come back to this. Yeah. You've you handled that beautifully. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So as I said, France and England were slow to get into the uh, game of empire in the Western Hemisphere. Um, uh, Portugal and Spain were the main powers and were vying with each other. And Holland emerged also uh, a, a little bit later. And France and, Spain, and, and, and England, subsequently Britain, were kind of laggards. And they were left with little tiny bits of territory in the Eastern Caribbean. England had Barbados, which we've heard about. France had two very small, other, similarly small islands, Martinique and Guadeloupe. Um, and then in the 1730s, France um, uh, takes control of uh, a, the western third of the island of Hispaniola. Hispaniola is the island where present-day Haiti and Dominican Republic are, are located. And France 
begins, France has seen how, how incredibly wealthy Britain has gotten in a short period of time from the, the two institutions we've talked about, chattel slavery and the plantation, and says, we're going to, we have this big fertile area called, uh, which they called Saint-Domingue, that's the name they gave to the Western third that they controlled at Hispaniola. We're going to get into this, um, act, this sugarcane production business uh, with both feet ourselves. So from 1730 to 1780, in that period of time, the French throw everything they can into transporting Africans across the ocean to uh, their, their new colony in, in Saint-Domingue, uh, on Hispaniola. Uh, and it becomes, in the process, the greatest, or the richest, greatest is the wrong word, the richest colony, and this is not just in my estimation, you'll find this all across the literature of this era, the richest colony in the history of the world, the richest colony in the history of the world on the basis of our institutions, these twin institutions, chattel and plantation, right? For the production of sugar. Um, uh, Hispan uh, Saint-Domingue is the, um, uh, accounts for about one third of all of France's external trade in this period, which is an astounding thing. Uh, one third of an island located half a world away is responsible for one third of the trade of uh, con European continental France. Uh, this is the era precisely spoken of in fr by French historians as the golden century. And when you under you see golden century, you must summon images of the palace at Versailles and things like that. This is the period where France's wealth just increases by leaps and bounds. This is all based on our two institutions. France brings staggering numbers of Africans across the Atlantic to put them into uh, the brutal production of sugar uh, and also of cocoa and uh, to some extent of, of cotton and tobacco and various other indigo and various other tropical plants in Saint-Domingue. I should let you know, by the way, one another important sort of data point that in all of these sugar plantation places in the New World, where chattel slavery is the model, of the um, uh, where, wherever sugar is grown, the, the average life expectancy of an African who has arrived in the New World to, to be put to work growing sugar as an enslaved person is five years. And it is expected that they will be burned out, worn out, killed by disease or otherwise die at the end of five years. And it is considered a simple feature of doing business, a cost of doing business. This is factored in as a kind of morally, ethical, ethically, and economically normal feature of business that, yes, it's like a, remember we talked about what chattel means and it relates to cattle and it involves dehumanization. So the business plans of plantation owners Think of human beings and of their lifespan of five years as you might think of an industrial tool. Well, the, the, the motor or the spark plug or the this or the that's going to wear out after you have to replace it every five years. That's just a normal feature of doing business. Well, this is how the, the, the plantation owners uh, thought of their human capital, right? These chattel, in chattel human beings. Anyway, in 1791, uh, the enslaved peoples of uh, Saint-Domingue rose up in revolt. Uh, secretly, they coordinated across the, the sugar plantation regions of the colony. They burned down a, an enormous number of plantations in one single night, and then they waged war against uh, the French uh, for their liberation. Uh, the, 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 the Africans, I'm calling them Africans because, it, in fact, they were deliberately drawn from different parts of Africa so as not to be able, precisely so as not to be able to make a common cause with each other and to plot to overthrow or to resi resist their masters. They overcome these barriers. They rise up in revolt in 1791. They defeat France. Napoleon sends the largest fleet he has ever sent across the Atlantic to beat them, and the Africans win. Then the Spanish, one of the other great imperial powers, on, who occupy the other two thirds of that island say, listen, this is too big a prize for us to, to simply let it go. We're going to invade Saint-Domingue and take it over for ourselves, the Spanish. The Africans defeat the Spanish. 
then the British who have who control nearby Jamaica. You can see Jamaica from a certain part of, of, of Saint-Domingue. Um, uh, the British send their fleet uh, and the Africans defeat the British. By the way, more British died at the hands of the Haitians than they died in the American Revolution. We all learn about the American Revolution and there's good reason to learn about the American Revolution, but somehow we don't learn about this. More British people died in trying to keep Haitians enslaved because the Africans won than British people died in trying to keep America as a colony, right? And so the Africans have defeated the French, they defeat the Spanish, they defeat the British, and then Napoleon, who is the emperor of France, comes back yet one more time, sends another enormous fleet across the Atlantic to try to defeat the Africans, and the Africans win this time in 1804. Napoleon uh, gives up. Haiti is born as an independent republic, the second republic in the Americas after the United States. Haiti and the Haitians, uh, who they are, must now be called, write a constitution at this time, which is the I call the, the most um, thorough fulfillment of the, the values of the Enlightenment ever realized in this era up until this point. Um, Haitians write into their constitution not only that there shall never be slavery again, but that all people are created equal, get this, regardless of race, that there shall be no discrimination, not just by whites against blacks, but by blacks against whites, or by any race against any other race. Now, as my audience will know, we here in the United States didn't get around to making sure that racial discrimination was legally um, uh, invalid until the lifetimes of many of the people in the audience, certainly my lifetime, right? Um, in, in 1967, the Supreme Court ruled in a case called Loving versus Virginia that white people and black people could marry each other legally for the first time in the state of Virginia, right? Think of that. In 1804, the Haitians in their constitution had judged that there shall not be any kind of discrimination between races on any basis whatsoever. Okay, so now back to your, your immediate question, Carlo, which is how did this form American history? Well, Napoleon nearly bankrupted himself by, by trying twice to defeat the Haitians, to send these enormous fleets across the Atlantic and each time losing. Napoleon had um, uh, campaigns in Europe at the time, especially against Russia, trying to subdue Russia and to aggrandize France as a big empire in Europe. And Napoleon had to make a choice. Do I hold on to my American holdings uh, and maybe lose in Europe? Actually, Europe's where France is, so that sounds pretty dangerous. Or do I get liquidate my American holdings, sell them so that I have enough money to continue my campaigns in Europe? And of course, that's what Napoleon did. Napoleon sold uh, France's enormous holdings in North America. We in this country forget too often that France used to be a big colonial power in even in America. It controlled the so-called Louisiana Purchase, which is most of the Midwest, from the upper mid Midwest all the way down to Louisiana. Um, and so France agreed with the Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson administration to sell the Louisiana Purchase to the United States for $15 million. Because it was desperate for money, because the Haitians had defeated France twice. And so by virtue of the Haitian um, victory, the United States then becomes doubled in size overnight as a result of the Louisiana Purchase. And really for the first time in its history becomes starts to become a truly continental power. You know, this opens up further exploration of the country and domination later, subsequently of the, of the Western parts of the country, meaning all the way to California. But it also does something uh, of extraordinary immediate economic importance. It opens up the Mississippi Valley for the institutions that we saw uh, that were born in Sao Tome of plantation agriculture and of chattel slavery. And there is a, a gigantic forced migration of enslaved African-Americans out of the so-called Old South, places like Virginia and South Carolina, walked, literally walked by foot across the United States into the Mississippi Valley, where they were then put to labor 
in plantations for the purpose of growing cotton. And cotton becomes in the in the in the second part of the um, uh, well from the late eighteenth century through the middle of the nineteenth century by a very grand distance the most important economic product of the United States. Uh, it's it's uh, leading export by far, the most um, important source of um, of, of, of uh, profit from banking uh, and from labor uh, is cotton. Cotton is, of course, the sine qua non, meaning the indispensable ingredient of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, which is taking place beginning in England in this time, involves the the, the um, creation of of textiles and cotton. In I'm sorry, in industrial mills, the raw ingredient used for these textiles is cotton. This cotton is sourced in the Mississippi Valley. It is grown on plant in plantations through chattel slavery. And so you see this uh, intricate enchainment that I talked about as the basis of the West. Britain is rising first through, and we all rose eventually through industrialization, but Britain is rising first through industrialization and its raw materials are being produced across the Atlantic in the new world through another kind of industrial organization, meaning the plantation and the use of chattel slavery. The United States begins to grow um, uh, commercial cotton in a significant way in the 1790s. And back then, we're talking about tens of thousands of bales of cotton. Uh, I can't tell you what the what the, what the the net weight of a bale of cotton was, right? But a bale is not a great... Uh, you, tens of thousands of bales gives you an idea of the dimension. So by, by the outbreak of the Civil War in the United States in 1860, the United States is producing cotton by the billions of pounds. Okay, so we've gone from a few tens of thousands of bales of cotton in the 1790s to billions of pounds of cotton. And this gives you an idea of the explosive growth of the American ag uh, economy through the agricultural production of the plantation on the basis of chattel slavery. That is the culmination of this process that we saw, you know, in the end of the 15th century, meaning the late 1400s, on the little tiny island of Sao Tome off the coast of Central Africa. Thank you. I love that you cover six centuries of time in um, a very chronological way um, in the book. Uh, we do have, I do want to open this um, up to questions. That was the end of my questions. And there were a couple questions, uh, I believe three questions in the chat, if we can, if you have time to answer those. Sure. Dr. French, okay. The first one is, can you explore the importance of using Zora Neale Hurston's quote from Barracoon? Um, I don't, you know, I have given dozens of talks about this book, literally dozens. The dozens isn't, doesn't even begin. But it, anyway, I'm embarrassed. Um, I don't have the quote fresh in mind. I've never been asked this question before. Um, I have it here if you'd like. I can yes, read, it. Read, read it to me, please. Okay, so I have the book right here in my hand. I'm looking um, around my own office for my book. Um, please read it. <laughs> All these words from the seller, but no, but not one word from the sold. The okay. kings and captains whose words moved ships, but not one word from the cargo. So what? The, thank you. Um, and I didn't even need you to finish the reading for me to remember why I had used it. Right. Uh, so hopefully the um, the 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 person who asked the question. Uh, was mostly motivated by wanting other people to hear this quote. Um, uh, I think it's a very beautiful and succinct statement of the way history tends to work. The way history tends to work is the people who come out as the winners tend to dominate in the accounting for the events, right? And so this, this the quote from Zora Neale Hurston talks about how the kings and the captains, meaning in this instance, the people who came from Europe who dominated or who, who um, carried out the domination of peoples from Africa for the purpose of their own profit, right? Whether it was as Europeans or as new Americans are the people who fill our history books and their explanations of the processes that they were engaged with and, and the motives that drove them are the ones that drive our understanding or, or sort of predominate in terms of the telling of these histories. And that the people who were in the slave ships or the people who taken from the shores of Africa to be put into chains or the people who died 
in Barbados or in Brazil or in Jamaica or in Mississippi, uh, working on plantations at the end of a whip, right? Um, uh, and whose lives were ground out in sugar plantations in the space of five years from the point of arrival to their death, right? There's almost no accounting for them in the traditional way of history. Uh, we don't hear their voices. We don't understand. We, we are not given to understand. There's no priority given to understanding how they understood these processes or even beyond that, because it's hard to get into the minds of people if we don't have, and this is an inherent problem, we don't have a sufficient uh, uh, archival record of their thoughts, right? But we don't even get an adequate reflection from the people I've described as the victors, right? Of just how much reflection on just how much they profited from the destruction of others. Right? So yeah. that's how I would answer the question. Thank you very much. There is a related question. Mm -hmm. um, are Africans today aware of the voyage Africans took across the Atlantic Ocean to the New World and what they had to endure? Um, I think that there is a um, a broad understanding in Africa of that there was this thing called uh, slavery, transatlantic slavery, and that millions of people were taken across uh, the Atlantic Ocean for the, for this purpose. Yes, I think uh, um, there's a general understanding of this. Um, I don't think that um, this is all, you know, Africa is a continent of 54 countries, and um, it's hard to make a blanket statement about how Africans understand any one thing or are taught about something, right? Um, I don't, I have traveled widely in Africa, and I don't think um, uh, African education is consistently good or adequate on this topic. But I would certainly say that um, Africans are are fully aware that um, there was a period of history, the period, the, the exactly the period that we have been talking about, that was um, uh, 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 characterized by the mass enslavement of people brought from Africa to the New World. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question, what position did the Catholic Church take in terms of Portugal and Spain to reducing people into chattel slaves? Um, a very good question and an enormous role. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm a little shy in saying this, but I would really encourage you to, to buy, or if you don't want to buy, to borrow uh, my book from the library. It goes into this topic in great detail. I, I, in the interest of time, I'm only going to touch on two pieces of this, right? So um, the Catholic Church at the beginning of the, the birth of a commerce in human beings uh, uh, as chattel um, was wrapped up in a struggle with the Islamic world. Uh, subsequently, is wrapped up in, also in a struggle with the Protestant world. But in the first instance, it was wrapped up in a struggle with the Islamic world. And a justification that the Portuguese and then the Spanish used with the Vatican, meaning with the Catholic Church, for their enslavement of human beings on the basis of their race, which is what we said chattel is, consists of, right, uh, was that uh, the Portuguese and the Spanish would ensure that these Africans were converted to Christianity and that this would prevent them from becoming Muslims. Uh, and by preventing them from becoming Muslims, um, Christian the, the, the cause of Christianity would be advanced in the world. And so it was on the basis of this flimsy justification that the Catholic Church gives an initial blessing, so to speak, or green light for, for um, uh, what becomes a mass trade in human beings as chattel across the Atlantic. And this degenerates very quickly into ship born, um, uh, um, baptisms, not ship born baptisms, but baptism, baptism on the most figurative and, and, and abbreviated baptisms that you can imagine on the, on the planks leading from the shore to the ship, whereas Africans walked in chains onto the ships that would take them off to work and die in plantations, holy water or some substitute for holy water was sprunk, sp sprinkled over them. A very quick prayer was said and uh, they were then acknowledged to be Christian, right? Uh, the Portuguese or Spanish who were doing this certainly did not think that the Africans had any notion of uh, partaking in, in in any true sense in Christianity. But 
These are the sorts of rituals that they went through to try to justify vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, their activity. The other thing I must say is that, especially in the early period of, uh, of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, the Catholic Church was a very uh, big owner of slaves. Uh, it operated plantations itself in Mexico. Mexico is not normally think, thought of as a as a giant site for the slave trade, but in the in the first century, century and, and a half of the transatlantic slave trade, Mexico had quite a lot of Africans um, uh, brought there as to to work in plantations and in other industrial activities, uh, and the Catholic Church was a big landowner in Mexico, and um, the Catholic Church had big. Um, there was a, there was a priest named um, Las Casas, a Spanish priest, who became preoccupied with the enormous death toll that the native uh, populations, uh, Native American populations of Mexico and other parts of the Americans were experiencing, and he argued relatively successfully that the enslavement and uh, and brutal treatment of native populations had to be reined in, right? Uh, and so this led to just like I described in Brazil, for a period of time in Mexico, the substitution of Africans for native peoples in in, slave, in process, processes involving slave labor, right? And so huge numbers of Africans were enslaved in Mexico in, on Catholic-owned plantations. This was also true in Hispaniola. Uh, this was true to a lesser but nonetheless significant extent in Brazil and in various other places. And so the Catholic Church was a major player throughout all of these periods, uh, in these various places, in, in these processes. Yeah, I don't think I realized that they actually owned plantations, so. The Jesuits. Jesuits, okay. Mm -hmm. um, another question from the chat. Can you talk about the sale of Africans by other Africans? Um, sure. Um, so as I said earlier, um, slavery has been a, is a universal, a universal feature of human civilization. And slavery in, existed in Africa prior to the um, arrival of Europeans. Uh, and it sort of worked like this, as I'm going to describe to you. Uh, the, the principal preoccupation of African kingdoms, the principal measure of wealth and power, was the size of the population. Uh, and so African kingdoms vied with each other via war, just like peoples have fought uh, wars against peoples, other peoples throughout, everywhere throughout history. Uh, and um, a, a central feature of these African wars was um, the absorption of the defeated captives into the victorious society. And so you see an emphasis, therefore, on very rapid assimilation. The, the, cap, the captured women, I don't mean to prettify this at all. I imagine uh, by modern standards, all sorts of horrible things were happening. I shouldn't even take out the modern standards. All sorts of horrible things were happening. I'm sure that women were married off and abused with, with uh, you know, again, totally against their will, right? Um, but um, for, in, in terms of uh, setting up an answer to your question, it's important to understand that the emphasis from these societies, even in the midst of these brutal processes, was the assimilation of the captives into the victorious society, because the victorious, the whole purpose of the war was to grow the size of the society, right? And so the, the married off women and the, the men who survived the battles were quickly integrated. And the instances in which the offspring of, of, of captured people and sometimes enslaved people in, in this African context who then become kings or chiefs themselves are countless in the African literature. And so there's nothing like a chattel institution in Africa. Uh, there's no such thing as transgenerational slavery. This is not enslavement on the basis of race, meaning that if you're Black, you're going to be uh, considered a, a valid per, uh, candidate for enslavement, no, uh, you know, bar every other consideration, right? So right away, we see a very di a distinct differentiation between African slavery and chattel slavery. So the Europeans come with for the purpose of engaging in chattel slavery, something that the Africans had never witnessed before. Um, and the Africans are um, saying, uh, you know, as I try to recreate the thoughts, I, I devote a good amount of space in my book to this question, 
as I try to recreate the thought processes that they must have engaged with, I, I, I sort of imagine the Africans are saying, you know, the, these Europeans are coming here with various trade goods, luxury items, fancy cloth from Europe, um, uh, tobacco, uh, alcoholic beverages, other sorts of luxury products, um, uh, metals that we can work, meaning bronze or uh, or brass or things like that that were treasured in places that did were not societies that were not rich in such metals. They want to trade with us. They want human beings. Well, isn't that curious? We don't. We want your human beings too. We can understand why they consider human beings a, an item of value, right? And so we'll trade some of our captured human beings to them in exchange for their brass or for their rum or for their tobacco or for their cloth or for their guns or what have you, right? The Africans who were doing this, who were engaging this kind of trade, were not going off on the ships to to Haiti or to Jamaica or Barbados or Brazil to actually see the purposes to which these other Africans were being put. They had no picture of this. I'm not saying that these are heroes. These, that, you know, they have sold other human beings, which to our contemporary sensibilities is a contemptuous sort of thing, right? And I, I, I completely buy that, right? I, I, I cannot imagine wanting to be part of the sale of another human being under any circumstances. However, these the, the the kings and chiefs who are selling enslaved Africans into uh, uh, bondage across the Atlantic have no picture of what chattel slavery is. They have no idea. It doesn't exist in their midst. They have no idea of plantation agriculture. They have no idea the purposes to which these people are going to be put or the ends to which they which they are going to meet with, et cetera, et cetera. And so from the perspective of Africans, um, the, the sale of human beings, as repugnant as it should be to us, um, is carried out with a very limited picture of what the purposes of this were for, uh, and did not seem, I don't think, unusual to them, given their own considerations, economic priorities in warfare and competition among themselves for the purposes of increasing their population. Yes, thank you. Um, so I think we probably have time for one more question. If anyone wants to unmute to ask one, one final question, I think that would be okay. Um, we're running up kind of against our time, but I wanted to make sure that all the um, questions from the audience, you know, everyone had a chance to ask a question. So I'll just, I'll just pause a moment. Uh, this is Ross Hoffman, to uh, ask a question. Uh, is there any way that uh, your research you might be able to to the amount of wealth that has accrued to Europe or the uh, key players in Europe uh, as a result of the slave trade and plantation slavery? We didn't catch all that. I don't know. Did you didn't catch much of that? that. No. No, I, yes. Uh, in your research, uh, have you come across any data or number that uh, would indicate the amount of wealth that grew to Europe as a result of the state trade and shadow slavery? That accrued to who? I, I, uh, accrued to, who? I, to, to Europe, the European countries. Yes. So, so as I said earlier, um, as I said earlier, I mean, uh, the, uh, the Portuguese in a very brief window of time in one pl single place, Brazil, made more money than the Spanish made, made more profit than the Spanish made. This is not a numerical answer to your question, but they made more profit from the from uh, the the plantation agriculture and chattel slavery than the than the Spanish made in the galleon trade. The galleon trade is a known thing, right? We know how much the volumes of gold and silver that were transported to markets in Europe, et cetera. Um, the Portuguese in the space of uh, uh, essentially 60 years make more money than the Spanish made in their entire process of conquest in the Americas. Uh, the English make more money between 1630 and the end of the 1600s in little tiny Barbados, one third the size of the city of Los Angeles. 
than the Spanish made in all of their conquests in the Americas, okay? Um, uh, so there are anecdotal ways of understanding this that may not uh, exhaust uh, your curiosity, but I think help us to get a grasp of what we're talking about. Um, from uh, 1730, when the French first begin to grow sugar in a big way commercially in Saint-Domingue until 1791, um, in that brief period of time, uh, Saint-Domingue, just one third of Hispaniola, becomes the richest colony in the history of mankind, right? Um, and that is all about chattel slavery and plantation agriculture. It fuels, and I give some, you know, I I wasn't anticipating this question, so I don't have the data at my fingertips. There's more of it in my books, in my book, but this is what fuels, as I said, the golden century of France. Um, and so I, I don't think there's much sincere dispute, and sincere is the operative word here, about the amplitude of the wealth effect uh, derived from these processes. Thank you. So we're running up against time and um, I did want, there was another comment I'd like to share with you in the uh, chat. Um, Marianne Harris says, thank you for bringing the book to life for me. I'm encouraged and empowered by your storytelling voice. Thank you, Marianne. That, that's my sister's name. So double thank you. <laughs> And I want to thank you um, to send uh, thank you to the audience and to you, Dr. French, for joining us. Um, the book does an amazing job of reframing our understanding of the modern world and puts Africa and Africans in its rightful place at the center of the development of the modern modern age. Um, I personally learned much from the book, and I appreciated how accessible it was to the average reader. Thank you. Thank you for hosting this, Carla, and thank you, Ross, for all of your help in setting things up and. It's really been a pleasure to speak to you. Yes, we've very much enjoyed it. So um, thank you again. And um, if you have not read the book, highly recommend it. Um, the library should have copies and also, but it is actually one that you would do well to purchase because um, there's so much information in it and you will refer to it again and again. So, uh, but thank you again one last time and um, Dr. French, the audience and to the East Cleveland Library and the Euclid Public Library for hosting the event. Thank you, Cleveland.